Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Tara Kelly, Vice President of Policy and Programs at the Municipal Arts Society of New York, and I'm delighted to kick the evening off. Tonight's program has truly been a group effort, and I want to take a moment to recognize our collaboration that made this possible. To our partners and hosts, Center for Fiction, thank you for welcoming us to this exciting new space, which is quickly becoming a locus for art and dialogue in our city. To Randy and the Person Place Team thing, uh, Person Place Thing Team, thank you for creating this fantastic platform for conversation and connection. And finally, Jennifer Egan, we are truly honored to have you joining us tonight. MAS's roots date back to 1893, a time when Brooklyn was still an independent city and the Navy Yard was home to admirals and not at Wegmans. <laughs> the characters and communities who made their homes here have left their mark on the city we know today and we cherish artists who managed to bring that complex history to life. Jennifer's novels are remarkable for their ability to link our past to the present, deepening our understanding of New York and the people, places, and things that shaped it. She is an ideal guest for this program, and I know we all can't wait to hear from her. So, please welcome Kristen Henley, Managing Director at the Center for Fiction, to introduce uh, the show. Woo! Sorry, you get the introduction to the introduction to the introduction. Sometimes it happens. So uh, as Tara mentioned, I'm the managing director at the Center for Fiction. Um, we're thrilled to be working with the Municipal Arts Society as well as Person Place Thing to present tonight's um, program. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the center just in case you didn't know about us. And what's amazing about tonight's event, between the Municipal Art Society and the Center for Fiction, we have about 400 years of history here in this building. We were actually founded in 1820. Uh, little shade on them, we're actually older, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Um, but to tell you a little bit about us, the Center is a literary arts organization whose mission is to promote the art of fiction, and we do this in a variety of ways. But I wanted to highlight our bookstore, which you walked through tonight. And um, we're actually a nonprofit, so all of the proceeds from our bookstore go to help our programs for kids. We give books, and we bring in kids into this very room that you're in to meet their favorite authors. We also support emerging writers through our work. So I hope you'll stick around, buy a book, do a little holiday shopping from us, and support some kids. and explore the other spaces in the center. We actually have a whole other floor above us. And if you join us as a member, hint, hint, then you get access to that space. So I'll be around, please ask me questions. And now I'd like to um, introduce Randy Cohen for Person, Place, and Thing. Or excuse me, Person, Place, Thing. No and, thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you so much for coming. I just want to say one thing that's not directly related to the program. Uh, Fiona Hill. That's all. Uh, I just, oh, oh, I, I'm not used to having hope for the future. Um, uh, I just wanted to let you know a bit about how this will work. I think uh, people are especially interesting when they don't speak directly about themselves, but about something they care about. And that's a structure we'll use tonight. Uh, Jennifer will speak about one person, one place, and one thing that are meaningful to her. Uh, we're recording for broadcast, so the no, no cursing rule is in effect. Yeah, I'm sick about it too, I know. I, I don't know why I'm singling you out, to, but you know. Uh, 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 from time to time, I'll say something e even more innocuous than this. I'll say, uh, we'll be right back. Uh, when I do, I'd be pathetically grateful if you would applaud like lunatics. Um, uh, the, the good news is you needn't mean it. Uh, it can be that kind of sarcastic applause that means he's such a jerk. Because uh, on radio, and the audio crew can back me up on this, it will sound like you like me, and I care only about appearances. Um, uh, what else? Oh, I, I like Person Place Thing is meant to be a show. It's a radio show. And to me, that means there has to be music. And I'm delighted that this evening, that music is Lily Henley and Duncan Wickle. Thank you. I 
Padre viene, me pone nueva a mi casa, a mi casa, triste y aflicada. Yo cerré mis puertas con siete andravillas, nuevo amor. Esas puestas con ricas comidas, yo me fui a mi casa, triste y aflicada. Yo cerré mis puertas con siete andravillas, muevo Ábrame mi alma, ábreme mi vida, que vengo cansado de ronda la vía. Si vienes cansado, cansado te irías. Donde pasas la noche, puedes pasar el día, muevo dolor. El del demonio que, que lo diría Hombre del huerco Yo que yo deía Duermite mi alma Duermite mi vida Que tu padre viene De donde mueva amiga Muevo amor I just like saying swing it in. Um, it sounds so filthy. Um, uh, so, uh, Jennifer, who's your person? My person is Francis Trollope, uh, more commonly known as Franny. And I came to know about her through her son, Anthony Trollope, the very prolific and really remarkable 19th century novelist and the great serialist. And um, I had been sort of curious to know more about his family life because the women in Trollope's fiction are really fascinating. They, he finds many, many different ways to explore the question of what happens to a woman who wants power in a society that allows her none. So there are these kind of, there are, there are women who control their husbands, so they sort of have power that way. And then there are women who basically, um, you know, undermine their husbands, so they have power that way. And you look so pleased with the second one. <laughs> 
Well, he does. It, it's beautifully done. Um, and, you know, women who, who follow politics and influence them in every way they can, which is always very indirect. Um, and so I was actually teaching a Trollope novel at um, the University of Pennsylvania last semester, and I thought, I really want to know more about his family, and I couldn't believe that I didn't know about his mother, Fanny. So Fanny is, is most famous for a book she wrote, but it really started with a trip to America in 1828, and she had various kind of wacky ventures that she wanted to embark on here. Uh, she brought three of her, three of her seven children, she left Anthony in England, he was 12, and in school, like, very resentful at being abandoned and left behind. And she also left behind her husband, who was very depressive, had terrible headaches, a, very, a difficult man, and they had huge financial problems. So she came here, and among the things she attempted was in Cincinnati, where she spent a fair amount of time, she tried to create what really was sort of a, I, I think she envisioned as a, a fashion, as a, um, a mall. She wanted a place where there were there was um, commerce and entertainment, um, where people would come and just spend time and money. Um, and she actually had a building constructed, which was known as Trollope's Folly. So clearly, there were questions about how this was going to work, and it, it didn't work. So she had this a, a trip in which nothing worked. It lasted three years. But she was taking notes the entire time, and she came back and very quickly wrote a book called The Domestic Manners of Americans, in which she absolutely skewered us from, <laughs> from every angle, from every side. And the Brits loved it. So she became an instant bestseller and a huge celebrity. So this was Trollope's mom, and who knew? Um, uh, well, the, 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 all the people in England knew that, that uh, this book became so so successful that uh, she became a verb. Uh, to trollopize was to say horrible things about Americans. <laughs> right? Right? She really did not like us. Although I will say the one place she loved was New York. She was here for five weeks, I think, and she said it was the great metropolis of the new world, but every other place. And, and I have to say she's persuasive in many ways about <laughs> The, t the, the ways that we behaved. Oh, she hated us. On um, every here's level. The, here's the part I wrote down. What do you make of this? Uh, she's by them, she's, she's talking about Americans. I do not like them. I do not like their principles. I do not like their manners. I do not like their opinion. <laughs> it sounds like her, right? Yeah, no, and, she's, and she had a great eye, and she was a wonderful writer. And she actually went on to have basically a career as a novelist and a travel writer. She traveled to many other places. But it's sort of wonderful. I mean, she actually found a way to support this large family to help her depressed husband um, to you know, get her kids through school in, in a world in which this was so hard to do um, for women. And I, I just, I found that amazing. And she did it by writing. She was very hard on a lot of women in America too, yes? Well, she felt women had a really bad deal here. And she actually, she, it's, she's not, she does not seem beguiled by the women of America, but she definitely felt sorry for them. And she talks about how the women do all the work. They, they look, she says that they look old by the time they're, you know, 20, basically. They're, <laughs> they've got kids sort of hanging from every arm and leg, and they, they also seem to be doing all the work. And then the amazing thing, she describes us as a society almost incapable of having fun at all. Um, <laughs> but when there were dances, um, a very occasional thing, uh, or any sort of parties, they were, men and women were segregated, except I guess on the dance floor, they had to sort of be together to dance. Um, and the women had, had, were treated terribly. They, the men would have these beautiful rooms to sit and have lavish meals, and the women would sort of hold their plates and, and didn't even have chairs. Um, men didn't like to socialize with women, and so women were excluded. So she basically, I think she felt that the, the women here had a lousy deal um, and 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 all and sort of took it. So and so in a way, I think she didn't respect the women very much. No, I don't think so. And uh, the one institution that seemed on the surface favorable to women, welcoming to women, uh, she thought was in fact helped oppress them just from a different angle. I'm referring to the church. 
Well, she has a lot to say about the church in America. Um, <laughs> The, the, ways that, the ways in which every sect is completely um, intolerant of every other sect. So she talks about that. She raises questions about these kind of um, charismatic leaders. She attended um, like camp meetings and um, various sorts of, of religious uh, celebrations, which she describes in great detail. But often there's a real sense of you know, power maneuvers at work and, and men sort of encroaching upon women. She really talks about that, especially young women. Um, something that sounded like um, similar descriptions in our age would be sexual harassment. She, I remember there's a part where she's describing a, a kind of revival meeting and the minister coming up and said like, put his arm around a young girl's neck. And it just, in five words, it made her think he's so creepy. Yeah, she's she was um, she had a pretty jaundiced view of all of that, and and I think she kind of she describes well the way in which since there were very few entertainments, and especially in a place like Cincinnati, you remember this is 1828. I mean, this was really this area hadn't even been very settled for very long, but there there wasn't a lot to do, and she describes a world in which these church activities and these gatherings become the locus of all of the sort of wishes and feelings and desires to interact that you might have found other ways to express in, in another kind of place like Europe, which is what she was dying to get back to. Um, she hated us for uh, slavery, which she saw as the, the ultimate moral nadir and, and the hypocrisy of a people that talked about liberty. We're constantly talking about liberty and freedom while, with, while we enslaved. And, and she's very sensitive to the Native Americans because oh, yeah. a lot of legislation was happening while she was here that was basically breaking and undoing treaties that we had made with Native Americans all over America. So she was repulsed by that. Um, and and it was, it's even, I, I read somewhere that she may have even influenced Harriet Beecher Stowe in some of her railings against these, um, the, against this hypocrisy, which she very correctly identified. Oh yeah, her book came out uh, 20 years before Harriet Beecher Stowe's book came out. Um, they later meet, you know, at the end of their life when, when um, uh, Fanny Trollope settles in Florence, this is many, many years later, and uh, Harry Feature Stowe came and visited her. Oh, I didn't it's know that. It's so cool. All I had visiting me this week, you know, my deadbeat friends. She was having like, like um, oh, we should mention, I think the thing that she viscerally hated as much as anything, aside from principal things that we've described, is she hated spitting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, it was, it was interesting. She hated it, and also it went on constantly. I mean, and that, that was fascinating to me, that this was a, I, it was, there was a lot of chewing tobacco going on, and therefore a lot of spitting, and the spitting sounds absolutely unendurable. I mean, and very unhygienic, and there were of cholera epidemics and all kinds of things going on, and these guys just spitting everywhere. I mean, she describes them as being also terrible conversationalists. She basically said, we really had nothing to say except to rant about how we were so much more free than everyone else, which, you know, as we were discussing, was undercut by hypocrisy and also undercut by the, the, the basic kind of unhappiness that she describes of daily life, especially for women. Miserable, miserable. I mean, she took such delight in, in pointing out how miserable it was. Um, she, uh, oh, we should mention why she first came, her initial plan when she first came. Tell them where she was going. She was going with, um, with a Scottish suffragette um, named Fanny, Fanny Wright, Wright yeah. to a place called Neshoba, which was in Tennessee, which as I understand it was a piece of land dedicated to uh, freeing and educating enslaved people. Yes. Um, and but it, the idea was somehow to not only um, free and, and and educate enslaved people, but actually make them become aristocrats, as I understand it. So it's a it's a complicated idea of what <laughs> what she, what you know what the goal is exactly. Um, so she, so Fanny loved the thought of that, and um, but when she got there, what she found was that Neshoba was really a mess. It was mos it was you know mosquito ridden. Um, she describes in general American forests were really ugly. She thought she said that the trees were too dense and light didn't reach the bottom, and Neshoba was very depressing. And she did have these young children with her. She was worried they would get sick, so she actually only stayed in 
Neshoba for 10 days. Um, and I think that the entire project, as I understand it, failed, and the formerly enslaved people were, uh, were sent to Haiti, I believe, yes, to, be, yes. to live free lives. So that at least was good. But it, it was just one of these projects that, even conceptually to a, a modern uh, ear, sounds sort of strange, but I guess made sense at that time. Uh, and it was a time of uh, all kinds of utopian communities were being established, uh, the Oneida community around the same time. And this was meant to be some of that, but she gets there and it's just this malarial swamp. And, and, and the few Africans that they managed to somehow get there seemed utterly bewildered by what Fanny Wright was up to. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think the other thing is that Fanny herself was only there sporadically. I mean, you know, it took a long time to get from here to there ah. at that point. So I think there, there was an idea that, that maybe there just weren't the funds or the sort of the wherewithal to quite make this the remarkable uh, idyllic place that they wanted it to be. Um, we should say a little about uh, her relationship to Anthony. Anthony did not like his mother. Well, Anthony, I mean, he was a very unhappy kid for many reasons. He, um, the fa his dad was a lawyer and they lived in London proper, but then they moved to Harrow, which I think now is basically a suburb, but then was the countryside. And so he went to Harrow School, which was a pretty Tony school, but he went as a townie and he felt very ostracized and apparently really was ostracized. Also had this sort of strange depressive father um, then he went on to Winchester, um, which is another very Tony and good school. But again, in, in, a, in his own autobiography, Anthony Trollope describes himself as being shunned and treated miserably every step of the way. And, uh, and so I think he, to some degree, blamed his family for this. Um, their financial problems and failure to sort of encompass him with the kind of status that would have helped him socially. And I think, I mean, I haven't seen him in a clinical setting, but um, it seems noteworthy to me that he didn't have his first big success, which I guess was Barchester Towers, till a year after his mother retired. That's interesting. I actually didn't know that. That's great. Well, he had a, he had a career, and he really seemed to come into his own in a, as a sort of um, happy and complete human being working for the post office in Britain, which he did incredibly successfully. I mean, he actually helped to, uh, he did a couple of things that were very important. One was that he helped to enact the penny post, which was basically a telecommunications revolution. Because what it meant was that for the first time, everything cost a penny no matter where you were sending it. And the amount of mail that began to be exchanged w increased hugely. And it's so funny because his novels are full, I mean, most novels are, are full of letters at that time, but his really are. And there's, <laughs> there's one where he actually, he more than once follows a letter through its passage from one person's hands to the next. Um, so he was fascinated by postal activity. And then he, his actual, his real invention was the, the red postal box that you still see in, in Britain. Wow. Wow. So he thrived and he for a long, he continued <laughs> to write while working for the postal service. And in fact, Bar the, the Barchester series, which takes place in a fictional landscape, was in fact an area that where he worked as a, as a postal employee. And so he wrote the first book of that series, which is called The Warden, you know, while in the postal service. And that was sort of well reviewed, but not terribly successful. And then the second one, Barchester Towers, which is a, that's the one I taught at Penn, hilarious oh. book, fascinating from the point of view of women. Um, and then he really became successful, but I believe he continued to work for the post office for quite a while, even when he didn't need to financially, because he but, just liked it. But that seems like a good thing. No, because you have to have some experience of life. You can't spend the whole day writing, or can you? Well, you teach. Uh, I don't really teach uh, generally, but I, I do now and then. Um, but I, I like I'm I think of myself also as a journalist, and I guess maybe that's been the thing that's kind of kept me a little out in the world. But actually, it seems to me that as a civil servant, what what he found that he really hadn't had before was a hierarchy where he was actually able to to rise and have. Uh, authority, and that was what he had always missed in, in all of these educational institutions. Oh, instead of being held down by his awful mother. Well, I don't, I, you know, it's funny. I don't have the sense that he, that sh he particularly resented her, but that just may be my lack of knowledge. Well, or, or maybe your knowledge. Um, so uh, we'll take a moment.
and we'll be right back. Willie Henley. Uh, before we talk about your place, uh, everyone should have at least uh, some of Fanny Trollope's, uh, the sound of her words in their head. So you'll read a little passage? I will. I think I'm going to read about table manners. <laughs> um, so this is when, early in the book, when she was on a steamboat um, in Mississippi, and this was on the way to Neshoba. The total want of all the usual courtesies of the table, the voracious rapidity with which the viands were seized and devoured, the strange uncouth phrases and pronunciation, 
the loathsome spitting, <laughs> from the contamination of which it was absolutely impossible to protect our dresses. <laughs> the frightful manner of feeding with their knives till the whole blade seemed to enter into the mouth and the still more frightful manner of cleaning the teeth afterwards with a pocket knife soon forced us to feel that the dinner hour was to be anything rather than an hour of enjoyment. <laughs> I love her. Um, it's pretty fun. So, uh, where is your place? My place is the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is such a, it's a place that's so alive for all of us now and yet has such a long history. Um, and I had lived in the neighborhood for many years without ever having seen it or really even known what it was. So it, it's sort of one of these oddly hidden places that, that sort of sparkles at a distance and has had many different iterations and lives. Uh, did you discover, well, I'm just curious, how many people have been to the Brooklyn Navy Yard? Oh, that's oh. amazing. That's a big change. A third, at least, wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's really something. The cops estimated that as 4,000, by the way. Uh, uh, but so what, what I've, I have not been to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. I say with some embarrassment, um, we can all go now. Uh, uh, and then come back and uh, actually we can't because it is a closed industrial park which is what one thing that that it offers its tenants some measure of security and the fact that you can't just walk in actually I, uh, my entire life I've wanted to have some measure of security and <laughs> you know, never did so I, I envy that but did you first investigated because you were researching. I did. I was interested in the waterfront during World War II and that it, the New York waterfront during World War II and that immediately led me to the Navy Yard because what I hadn't known is that it was an incredibly important place during World War II. It was actually the largest builder and repairer of allied ships in the in the country for sure. Uh, and it built 17 battleships and repaired 5,000 allied ships. So I, I suddenly was interested in this place that I had dimly known of, and I went on a tour, um, a kind of informal uh, tour with an archivist who worked there. So there were actually no structured tours yet of the Navy Yard. And it was, it was so amazing in so many ways. And one, one thing was just, it's huge. It's 300 acres. And that's actually smaller than it was at its largest. I happen um, to know it was 356 at its peak. Dur exactly, during the war. It, it grew and, and shrank over time. Mm -hmm. But, um, and, and so I was just, and, but the other incredible thing in 2005 when I first went, and this has changed to some degree, is that there was a lot of the war still left. There was old World War II signage around, you know, huge buildings were just in a state of total decay and hadn't been touched since the war. And Building 77, which reopened fairly recently and now has a Russ and Daughters in their food court. Um, <laughs> when I first went there, it was that's where the captain of the yard's office was. There were no windows on the sides, just at the top, and that's where you could look down and really see the whole of the Navy Yard. And when I toured it, the ceiling was caving in, there were icicles, there was snow, they're in, inside the building, and there were World War II maps on the wall still. So it was really almost gothic. Um, it was really quite quite surprising. And I felt I, place is something that drives me enormously in fiction, and my excitement about that place is, is a lot of what powered Manhattan Beach, which was the book I was starting to research. Um, do, you th do you think you would have felt that way if it had been tidied up at all? What Was it because it was a ruin? There's a romance to ruins. For sure, but I think the fun of it was that some of it, I mean, Steiner Studios was already there. So there's a movie studio in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and, and many other, uh, there were not as many state-of-the-art buildings then, but it was the odd juxtaposition of these Ruins, you know, the old railroad transom, which I think is still there and still a ruin, where the cars were floated in from the East River. Um, and then, you know, that and then these sparkly movie studio buildings. So that, that strange juxtaposition was really interesting. Uh, you know, the, the, you don't object to repurposing a, a, an old site, do you? Well, I mean, I, I, who am I to object? I mean, no, I, not necessarily. I mean, there, were, there actually was a huge 
controversy over the, what's known as Admiral's Row, which was a series of very elegant houses where the officers lived. And in, I read a lot of oral histories and actually helped to conduct some um, with people who had worked at the Navy Yard. And there was one um, in which a couple was interviewed and she was the daughter of one of these uh, officers who lived and she, uh, who lived on Admiral's Road, she describes playing tennis in the tennis courts behind it, <sighs> and they would have these regular social mixers for the Navy guys who were in the yard. And she met one of them, and they married, and then they they were you know very elderly at the time of this um, oral history interview. Uh, anyway, Admiral's Row was uh, contested because the Navy Yard wanted to demolish it because the buildings were re relatively destroyed and President conservationists didn't want to, and I believe two have been saved, um, but the rest is now a Wegmans, which I believe is just about to open or has opened. So that's the, the strangeness of the Navy Yard is the way that it keeps, it's changing all the time, um, but there are still these bits of the war left. Uh, you make it sound a, a bit like um, something that's true of all cities, that part of what's fun about cities was, well, here, here's a deco building from the 30s and it's butted right up against an ugly glass building from now. And, and, and even if neither is all that interesting in itself, the juxtaposition is great. It is, and I feel like I caught, I caught the Navy Yard at a great moment when it was trying to really take ownership of its history. There was no clear archive, everything was kind of in a mess. Um, now there's Building 92, which is a, um, a sort of exhibit space and a research center. Um, and that was just an idea, really, that that was barely even being conceptualized when I first started visiting the Navy Yard. So I had a chance in some ways to watch some of that happen. And I ended up partnering with the, with the Brooklyn Navy Yard and the Brooklyn Historical Society to work on an oral history. We interviewed fascinating people, not just people who worked at the yard, but one gentleman, for example, had grown up next door to the Navy Yard. His mom ran the newsstand where the, bus, where the buses stopped. And he was a, a, a gentleman named Don, Don Condrell, who drew us a really detailed map of the area around the Navy Yard. And he remembered everything. He knew the names of the bars. He <laughs> informally mentioned where the prostitutes stood. Um, <laughs> you know, so he, it was just, I mean, he, what a resource. He drew a gigantic map that I still have a photocopy of, which helped me because that whole area has been raised and, and many of those streets demapped to create the BQE and the Farragut housing project. So there's, it's really not there anymore, the area around the Navy Yard. Um, would you say a little bit more about how, uh, you said place is important to you and how place in, informed the writing of this book in particular, Manhattan Beach? All of them equally, I would say. But I, I tend to begin with a sense of atmosphere, a sense of possibility that, that feels rooted in a particular time and place, that seems to come before there are people. Uh, it's as if once I'm focusing on that place, then the, the people who would naturally be there seem to arrive and then they do things and then that's how a story unfolds. I mean, obviously there's endless revising here, but you know, in, the, in my oral history interviews, both those that I helped to conduct and read, there were so many incredible anecdotes about all the different kinds of people who came to work at this Navy Yard during the war. And it ran the gamut from like, there was one guy who, well, first of all, any man who wasn't able to join the military felt very insecure about that, which was interesting to me. I hadn't thought about that before. This gentleman had a hole in his eardrum because his his teacher, when he was very young, had boxed his ears in school, which was a very regular practice, and actually burst his eardrum and it wouldn't heal. And because of the danger of gas in a war, um, poison gas, he was not allowed to fight. So he felt so anxious about it. And he worked as a, an assistant for a fire inspector who was very unpopular because that was the guy who came along and said, you're breaking this rule, you're breaking that rule. And he described people like throwing things at him um, I mean, really a, a difficult environment. So that's just one, I mean, there were all, so many different perspectives, people of all ethnicities. There were many African-Americans who worked there too. And I had a chance to speak with a couple of African-American women who had worked at the Navy Yard. So these stories somehow all swirled together and created in a way a sort of texture of, of lives that weren't mine, but that I had access to when I finally sat down to write. 
Do you um, have feelings about how much liberty you can take with changing the geography? Like, you know a lot about the Navy Yard, and you have this map, and you know where specific things are. Is it OK to make up a new road? Can you put a new building in? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I feel more and more that the reason to know everything is to know where you can take your liberties and chances. Um, I did add a building, I will confess. But you look, at, you look mildly chagrined by that. Well, I mean, I, in a way, I, I, I would be unlikely to change geography normally. I don't know that there wasn't a building devoted to diving. I definitely know there was a diving tank in the yard. And in fact, you can see it. It's a teeny little circle on these maps if you know where to look. Um, but it, I sort of needed a building to be adjacent to that. And the fact that that particular part of the yard is not only gone, you know, has been demolished, but isn't even really part of the yard anymore was very helpful to me. Um, it, you general, didn't actually <laughs> yourself. No, well, there no, was a strange no. explosion in the course of working on my book. No. Um, yeah, so, so I, I was very careful not to disturb facts, but when there were questions, I would, you know, sort of gray areas, I would sometimes turn those to my creative advantage. Because, I mean, there are other writers who will invent completely fictional landscapes. Um, and nothing wrong, I mean, there are different ways to do this. Um, Absolutely. Do you, I want mean, to, do you hate that? No, I think that's great. I Should mean, we call some of them? Because I have names, right? You know. Well, sometimes the landscape isn't even real. Like, I wrote a gothic thriller, and the, the place, as it were, that fascinated me was not even a place that exists in real life. It's a kind of a literary film landscape of the Gothic, which has a long history and certain tropes that tend to reappear. So that wasn't even a real place. But once you know, once you're setting it in a real place, then there are more restrictions on you, yeah? Oh, no? I guess I don't, I didn't really perceive it that way. I, I mean, I guess that's fair. But I, I, for me, it feels more, there's some, something that becomes sort of fun about actually um, adhering to real details. There's something sort of nourishing about that because the story, of course, is totally made up. Right. Um, but it, it is interesting how just learning about things that happened in a place leads to so much information about who the people would have been that might interact there. Like as one example, in these oral history interviews again and again, people of all walks of life would mention in one realm or another a gangster that they knew. <laughs> I mean, that's not so true nowadays. Yeah. That, well, that let's, let's people... how many of you know a gangster? Straight stuff, how many really, truly? Oh, that's, gosh, I wish I had, had a chance to talk to you. <laughs> But that's um, a much smaller percentage much than smaller. has been have been to the Brooklyn Navy. Yeah, exactly. So um, you know, the waterfront was a very corrupt place, uh, and um, and I think the Navy Yard probably less so because it was very strictly controlled and it was wartime. Um, but but that that sense of ga the gangster as a a quasi acceptable job title, which really was what came to be clear to me as I was doing these oral history interviews, was really fascinating and may led me to do more research about why that would be and the, the aftermath of prohibition, the fact that Americans had wanted to still drink during those, you know, 14 years when prohibition existed. And so the gangster was a kind of liquor dealer figure who was in some ways very welcome, especially in the world of nightlife. And that took a long time to wear off. So all of this arose from place. That's, that's why I'm interested in it, because it seems to lead to everything else. The diversity of people that worked at the Navy Yard that you mentioned several times, that seems um, an incredibly healthy part of American life. And we're an immigrant nation. And, and, and that you could bring people together from so many walks of life. So the first time someone would, would well, there were, when my dad's experience in the Second World War, was, he met a lot of people. So he was the first Jew they ever met. That's a good thing. Um, um, and that, that if you're going to have a democracy, you need institutions that do that. So the public schools used to be one. Um, do, do you feel bad that we've lost that? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that we've completely lost it. I think one, one thing I love about New York, frankly, and the reason that I've made it my home is that I feel like it is a place where even just physically, I mean, it's a walking city. I've never owned a car in my life in which I am 
physically in sharing space with people that I would never probably meet in my, you know, work life or social life, but I'm, we're all here together. I mean, that's what I love about New York. So I guess I'm very drawn to those environments. And I think that is what was so fascinating about the Navy Yard. It brought together, and even the people we interviewed, you know, there was one woman who clearly was from a very wealthy family um, and she was sort of, and of course there were, there was stratification at the Navy Yard. I, it was not like everyone was treated Well, I'm not equally. suggesting it was utopia, but it, at least you were interacting with people who weren't exactly like you, who had absolutely. different backgrounds and different ideas. Yes, absolutely. And, and people approached those differences differently. Like some people clearly had a very uh, sort of blinders on approach to their work. They did it, they left. Um, and other people were really there for the experience. And there was one person um, whose letters I encountered at the Brooklyn Historical Society, a woman named Lucille Culkin. She was a fantastic ob observer. Uh, you know, she her writing style had something in common with Fanny Trollope, actually. <laughs> um, she met her husband at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, so they had a romance and, uh, and then got married. And uh, she referred to it as from maidenhood to marriage in three easy months in Ooh. one of her letters. <laughs> Um, but she was a fantastic observer and she loved, she was Jewish and so was Al, her husband, but she, and her world, her social world was Jewish, but she loved meeting all kinds of people at the Navy Yard. And at one point she actually wrote about an African-American woman she was working with. She was a ship fitter, um, who, who, I think her name, I can't remember, Minnie, I believe, who said that she felt she was not getting promoted because she was... African American, and she felt that she was had two strikes against her, being both female and a, and a woman of color, and uh, and so Lucy and all the other um, the girls, which is what they all called each other, that, who worked with her, you know, tried to make her feel better and gave her a big pep talk, and she and then and so she described all of this in a letter to Al because he had joined the Navy. And then she followed up and said, by the way, Minnie stayed, and it's, it's really great. She decided not to quit. So uh -huh. I, there were whole stories that I was able to follow through Lucy about all these different kinds of people, and that was really fun. We'll take a moment. We'll be right back.
Jackie, here we go, Lily Henley. Uh, just a quick bit of housekeeping. Uh, Jennifer will sign books at, at the end, yes? Absolutely. Anybody's book or just your book? <laughs> yeah, your book, right? People want your book. Yes. You're not going like, to do you know, Herman Melville because that would be wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, we'll edit a version of this for broadcast. It'll air in about six weeks. Uh, the next show we're doing next week is this extremely cool guy, Martin Dowling, who, who used to be Mario Cuomo's health advisor. At the, we'll be at the Irish Art Center. And the week after that, we're doing uh, Frances Burnett. You know who that is? She's the president of uh, Pratt. Um, she trained as a civil engineer and went on to design for dance companies. You know, um, uh, this is a lot to keep track of. I realized if only someone would send you an email and remind you. Um, well, we have a clipboard, um, and we're not afraid to use it. So we'll, we'll pass it. And if you'd um, like to get an email, you know, want maybe once a week to let you know what we're doing next, just give us your email address, and um, we won't send them any porn, um, unless you want porn. Um, and then just put a little P by your name. Uh, we'll try to sort you out. So um, what's your thing? My thing is uh, this book by, that is called The Carbon People. This is a book of artwork um, and also narrative by my brother, Graham, who uh, had a very hard life. He was um, schizophrenic. And we were very close. And in many ways, you know, being schizophrenic is not as different from being a fiction writer as you might think. <laughs> because as he once put it, I can't believe this. We both hear voices, and you get to make a living from it. And like, I'm barely hanging on. Um, he was hilarious. And he also was a visual artist. And he made um, digital art, and, and, but all very, um, with very, uh, on a large scale, with very lush, sort of gleaming surfaces. And he devoted himself to this very intensely. And he wanted to gather all his artwork into one place. Um, so he started imagining this book. And he wanted to show the progression of his artwork. And then he started writing a narrative about sort of how he ended up doing this work. And that really became a narrative of his illness and how what his delusions were and when they had set in. And I knew about all this because we would talk about it very regularly. I mean, I would ask him about his voices as if they were like un unpleasant colleagues at work. And I wanted to see, you know, how they were behaving. Um, <sighs> And so we worked together on this narrative and I was kind of his editor, which was really, which he loved because, you know, we kind of had business meetings and I gave him notes and I kept trying to get him to talk more about himself and less about the work just because it's, it was so compelling to read this very um, rich description of what it felt like to go crazy. Um, and so we worked on that and he pulled all of this together and he set up the entire thing and had it ready to roll and then he took his life. So I think that the goal for him, which I didn't realize um, and none of us did, was to create an object to kind of leave behind to, so that there was more, that, that he had something more than just the people who adored him and there were many of us, um, but really an object that kind of pulled it all together. Um, you, you speak about him in such jovial terms, and, and he, you cite him um, talking about his voices in an amused way, but it must have been quite painful. It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. Um, but he really was a funny guy, and, um, and so he found ways to... I, I think the, the horror was always pretty solitary, and it was really when he felt at the mercy of his inner world... Uh, without the, which was something that none of us could reach. No one could rescue him from it. Um, it was like he was a soldier who had to keep going back into this battle and there was no way for it to end. Um, so, but we, we always laughed when we were together, even about the, the crazy things that went on. And we actually, we used to, for a long time, we would talk about writing, collaborating on a screenplay about someone like him, and it would be a comedy. That was the idea. Um, that never happened, but it was, it was nice to think that it would. Um, older brother or younger brother? Younger brother, six and a half years younger. Um, and uh, 
how did he make a living? He didn't really, he wasn't really able to work. Um, so he was, you know, he, he, his, we had different fathers. Um, his father knew that he would need help and sort of created a, a, a way for him to have enough money to live on. Um, because it was clear from the time that he was in college that he really was not going to be probably living a very mainstream life. And, you know, I wonder sometimes, I mean, the drugs are changing all the time. I think we're so much more familiar with the idea of mental illness now. I mean, we had no idea what was wrong with him. The idea that he would have something like schizophrenia, it, that notion had to break through so many layers of seeming impossibility and therefore resistance for us to even grasp it. And I, I feel that a lot of that has really changed now, that people are much more willing to ask these questions early. So it may be that it, he would have had a better, that someone like him has a better chance now of living a, a, a mainstream life in some way, but he really could not. Do you think someone um, looking at the book now um, would have a sense of him as a person? That's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know. You know, his work, it's interesting. The work is very bright and very beautiful, and he was kind of obsessed with the surface of it. He wanted to get this certain kind of gleaming quality to the surface, and he tried putting uh, plexiglass over things, and then that wasn't gleaming enough, and he ultimately was using resin. Um, and it had this incredible, like, luscious quality to it. Um, so he wanted it to be, to be beautiful, I guess. But what he says is that he didn't care about that. In fact, this is all a kind of encoded version of his very uh, tortured inner world that he converted it. It's, it's like, really, he almost describes it as being a code. This is a coded version of what he went through and no one can decipher the code, and that's as he wanted it. He didn't even title the pictures. The Carbon People title came from an interview that I did with him years and years ago where I asked him to describe his inner world, and I had a tape recorder running, and sadly that tape vanished. But um, he talked. the Carbon People were, was part of a hallucination that he had repeatedly, um, which was that he would see these birds flying through the air and the motion of flying would make their wings separate from their bodies, and then they would return to them. So somehow that phrase, the carbon keep people, stuck with both of us as a great title. But there's a lot that he doesn't explain here. Um, you, you said it was a, a coded version of his inner life that, that he chose to present in code. Why do you think that was, rather than trying to, to be understood in a more direct way? Well. That's a good question. I think it gets to the very heart of the problem with an illness like this, which is that even though he understood that without medication, he was out and out, you know, absolutely delusional and non-functional. Um, so he understood that he had to take medication to make the voices quiet enough that he could do anything. But on some very deep level, he didn't believe, he believed it was all real. He actually believed that he was part of a different system of reality. It's fascinating to think about this today because we now live in a world in which politically we're living in two separate worlds. Our newspapers are, you know, are, are reporting very separate interpretations of what is actually going on. And it's, I think about it a lot because I think you know, this, this question about what is real pushed to its absolute limit is what psychosis is like, where you receive stimuli that you believe to be real because you have no choice but to believe it, but, you, but you're also told it's not real, that you know, these voices aren't real, it's all coming from inside you. In the end, the data for him was very persuasive that ultimately this stuff was real and he believed in it, but he also knew that you know, if he told me that, we were gonna, have a little conversation about that because I, I would not go there with him, especially because the voices were very abusive. You know, his, his delusions involved people really criticizing him and he was such a wonderful and remarkable and kind person that I just could not tolerate that and I insisted that it was not real. And, and I think he sort of believed it in moments, but in the end, that's what he had to go back to. That was home. There was no escape. 
Um, did he ever live in an institutional setting? He didn't. He spent time in institutions, absolutely, but he didn't actually live in one, no. And they weren't so helpful? Um, well, I mean, with as I say, without medication, there was no way to communicate with him at all, really. So, yes, I mean, he lived to be 46 years old. That's, you know, pretty long life for someone who's that ill. So I think the medication, family love, all of that kept him going for a long time. But in the end, I think really the problem was he got very tired and drained by all of it. And I, I really sympathize. I mean, it, there just comes a point where I think, you know, he, he felt like he was middle-aged and this idea that it would all somehow be different ultimately stopped holding a lot of hope for him. And what will happen with the book? Is it something for your family, for people who knew him? Will you try to get it out? Has it, have you gotten it out into the world? Um, not in any kind of formal way. I mean, there are some problems with it, for one thing. like the, Some of the images are a little distorted, um, which you only know if you really know his artwork, but it bothers me. No, there's no particular plan. We have a lot of copies. Um, if anyone's interested, I could send you one, maybe. Um, I mean, I, you know, he was very um, paranoid and uh, and and ab tremendously self-conscious. So there was no way for him to ever show this stuff around at all, except to family. So I I think he would be absolutely tickled by the idea that I'm talking to a room full of people about him and holding his book. I love the thought of that. And of course, we don't really know what happens after we die. So he may be sitting among us right now and, and had a, he had a very, very big grin. That's his grin. So his smile made everyone happy. And I love the thought of him getting a kick out of this. Well, I'd like to end on a hopeful note. And it's so kind of you to bring us there. Um, Will you take some questions from the audience? Absolutely. Uh, before we do, join me in thanking Lily Henley, Duncan Wickle, and especially Jennifer Egan. Um, so, someone will uh, pass among you with a microphone. How conveniently located you are. <laughs> Jennifer, thank you. Really impressive to hear your voice in this way. What's next? What are you researching now? Well, uh, I'm researching, actually, it's this sort of become right back to Fanny Trollope. I, I am, have gotten really interested in writing about New York in the 19th century. So even though I struggled with research and felt so inept at it that I often promised myself that I could, if I could just scrape through Manhattan Beach, I would never do it again. But in fact, and again, this is really place uh, related because what I find myself thinking about so much and, and, and at the Navy Yard too is how the physical plant of New York to some degree even now is really a 19th century construction. And so I'm interested in New York at the time that Row House New York came into being. Um, and so I'm just fascinated by that. So I'm researching that and, uh, and I'm also working on a companion to a visit from the Goon Squad. We'll see what happens with that. Um, kind Wait, what of do a, you mean by a companion? You mean like an annotated version of? Oh, <laughs> a um, separate book with? Well, yeah. I just mean um, it, it was always a very open-ended structure that felt like it, it, there were things that didn't work, and I kind of just did the best I could, and and um, had you know, and and there were lots of. Um, kind of loose ends, let's say. So I guess it, it was just natural that I would want to follow some of those into other realms and see what I what it, what I come up with. Cool. Gee, usually no one wants to ask the first question, and everyone wants to ask the second question. <laughs> uh, do you like? Um, I, I see. I would have thought doing research was a, a great deal more fun than um, actually writing. Writing is incredibly hard. But research is. You sounded like you had a great time. I did have a great time. I think what the only thing that the research itself was a delight and felt really important and thrilling, even when by I think uh, you know objective standards it was pretty dry. Um, but it was more that there was a very long period where during which I didn't, I, I couldn't kind of, this again gets back to place, I couldn't, 
occupy New York in that era with the kind of authority and, and sense of sort of textures and, and the, the place took a long time to really fill out for me. Mm -hmm. And so um, before that happened, there was a long period where I felt like I was sort of trying to write in another language and doing it very badly. Um, or, or, just, or at least doing it very stiffly and without much fun it, for the reader. So there was a long period where I thought, wow, maybe I, I just should really stay in my lifetime. Even though I don't write autobiographically, I do use places that I know. And I have a great memory for details of place. So I had sort of cut myself off from that one thread of connection between my real life and my work. And I felt like that was actually not a wise move um, for a certain period of working on it. But in the end, once I kind of crossed over and began to feel like I actually did know enough, I had heard enough and read enough anecdotes that I really could access all of the details that I needed, then it was so incredibly fun that I think that's why I want to try it again. Cool. Um, outside of the Navy Yard, do you have a favorite building or place in New York City that you'll share with us? That's an interesting question. I mean, I'm very drawn to the water, so I, I guess it's, I always want to go to the edges. Um, I love, I love being on the rivers, especially the East River, because I, ten, I, love, I lived on the, in the East Village for years and sort of used to run down there. Um, so that sense of, of sort of New York as an entry point is always really powerful for me. Um, probably more than a building, um, it, just that feeling of land and water meeting in New York Harbor is, uh, it's such a thrill. I, 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 it never gets old. I'm very interested in the development of writers and how people become writers. And is there a person, place, or thing in terms of that helped you become, that inspired you to be a writer? Was there a particular book or writer that you read that maybe liberated your voice, made you think that you could do this? Or was there a place? Was there a teacher? There was, there was a teacher uh, at my freshman year of high school who, who liked my writing, which was, which was great, but I did not think of myself as being a writer, actually, until, until I took a year off between high school and college. And uh, I had grand plans for this year that immediately went awry. Um, it's, I, I thought I would be paid to go on archaeological digs in places like Africa or Greece, um, which was ridiculous because no one was going to pay me to do that. And I was quickly informed of that when I wrote to <laughs> graduate programs asking for a job. And they said that their graduate students paid them to go on the digs. Um, so then I basically was a barista, um, although it, it, sadly that exciting name hadn't been invented yet. Um, <laughs> so I just worked in a coffee shop for many months. Um, and then I got a backpack and went to Europe um, and had a Eurail pass and was traveling around. And actually, this really does sort of lead back to my brother because I began to have panic attacks, which was another phrase I had never heard then. And, uh, you know, I and, and every other teenager growing up in the 1970s had read Go Ask Alice, which <laughs> it turns out is an apocryphal, it, it's actually fiction, but what it was about was a girl who took too many drugs and went crazy. Um, I think my mother might have written that one. Um, <laughs> and sadly, I had still taken too many drugs. So when I began to get these panic attacks, I thought that I, like Alice, had go was going crazy. And I actually thought I was mentally ill. And um, I, I believed that for a long time. And my brother was not at all symptomatic yet. He was completely healthy and well at that time. So um, anyway, I, I would have these periods that were absolutely terrifying. And then also a lot of amazing experiences. And I had never been to Europe. And I, I couldn't believe people really had English accents. I thought, no. They, could they really talk that way, even the children? Um, so it was, it was such an intense experience. And what I did the entire time was write in a journal, even when I was really having you know, in the terror, as I called it. I wrote through all of it. And I think somehow that experience of feeling the 
the integral role that writing played in every sort of extreme I experienced made me understand that I would have to write no matter what. It was not really linked to any notion of my having talent, I have to say. I, I, it was not so much feeling inspired exactly as feeling that this was almost like a belief system for me. It was what, ma what made the world complete, alive, active, and when I was having trouble, bearable. So I came back really knowing what I wanted to do, actually. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, it, it was a little bit of a hard trip. We have time for one more question. I see a gentleman. Oh. Manhattan Beach or, or just out of your love for neighborhoods, have you read Robert, Robert Caro's study of Robert Moses? I have not. I, um, Could you repeat the question? Because actually sure, holding sorry. the mic doesn't work as well as talking into it. Okay. Yeah, I've noticed. It's just me. It's my court. No, would you repeat the question? The question was, have I read the book about Robert Moses, um, Car Caro's famous book? I have not. Um, I, really? No. You shock me, ma'am. Well, I mean, first of all, Moses is the guy it's who great, was you know. erasing the landscape that I was so excited to be learning about. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I, I have many conflicting feelings about the work that he did and the effect it's that it had. It's not hagiography, you know. Yeah, you know. no, I know. Um, but it, I, I mean, the, the simple answer is it was after the period I was researching. Um, but in, in researching my area, I was coming up against him all the time because, as I said before, you know, the, the BQE, for example, really radically changed Brooklyn in so many ways. I mean, streets disappeared, um, houses disappeared, uh, and if you look at, um, for example, the uh, Park Avenue, which is where, right in the, near the Navy Yard, and the BQE goes over it, it's very dark and shady now. It was an absolutely beautiful boulevard, and I think it, because it was so wide is why the, the BQE is there now. So, um, but yeah, I have not read that book yet. One more? No? We could do one more because there's a woman back here who didn't get to ask hers. And I'm also happy to keep conversation going after we conclude. So I grew up in Manhattan Beach, which is the namesake neighborhood of your book. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you learned about that neighborhood when you were doing your research. So Manhattan Beach is interesting. I had not, um, I actually didn't know that that was a neighborhood in New York when I started doing my research. I knew about the one in California. Um, and it, I, I came up against it for a number of reasons. One was I was very interested in the history of Coney Island and the fact that it once had these very beautiful houses and it was where moneyed people went for their vacations up until the subway started going there and then everyone else started coming there and then the moneyed people didn't really want to be there anymore. But I, as I kind of dove deeper into all of that, I, I learned that Manhattan Beach actually was not easily reached. Um, on the subway, and so it remained this very elite area uh, for uh, for many reasons. There was a, a famous racetrack in Sheepshead Bay where you know horses were raced, and it was a, a real gilded age area. There are incredible photographs, and photographs had a big impact on me in the in some of these landscapes that have now disappeared. The photographs of these beautiful resort hotels that existed in what is in Manhattan Beach. Um, one was called the Manhattan Beach Hotel, there was one called the Oriental, and they were just these full service resorts right on the beach. So I was fascinated by that. Um, and then once the, during World War, then the area became sort of idle, it was little bungalows. And then during World War II, a lot of things happened on Manhattan Beach. It was a Coast Guard training center, it was a merchant sailor training center. So I guess I just, I, you know, sort of like the Navy Yard, it had many different moments and iterations, and it struck me as a, I felt when I visited it, which actually was after Hurricane Sandy, which had a terrible, I mean, the water literally poured down the streets and killed lots of trees and damaged a lot of houses, but I felt that same kind of resonance in the actual physical landscape of it, and I think 
all of that led me to be interested in it. It's now very Russian, um, so it continues to evolve. I think our work here is done. Uh, you'll sign some books. Jennifer Egan. <laughs> <laughs>